of the summer um, low residency and visual studies here at PNCA, the summer lecture series. I'm very pleased to, to have Minerva Cuevas with us today. I also wanted to just briefly um, discuss the graduation exhibition. So please come to the graduation shows. Uh, on Thursday, there's the open, opening for Ryan Kitson, July 27th. August 3rd, uh, Kelsey Hamilton Davis. Uh, August 10th, Madison Queen, and August 17th, Douglas Wilshire for the graduation show. So if you're in Portland, um, come and have a look at the graduating exhibitions. I wanted to welcome Minerva Cuevas and say a few words. Um, Minerva Cuevas, Mexico City, artists creating research-based projects that allow the audience an insight into the economic and political organization of the social sphere through site-specific actions and networks. Um, Cueva studied at the visual arts at the Escuela Nacional de Artes Plásticas UNAM in Mexico, founder of Mejor Vida Corp, and Inter International Understanding Foundation and member of Irrational.org. Um, important solo exhibitions include the Whitechapel Gallery at the Corimanzuto, Mexico City, Kunsthal Basel, and Tamayo Museum, and group exhibitions including Museo Pumex, the South London Gallery, Guggenheim Museum, uh, Kunstwerk Institute Canary Art Berlin, Pompidou Paris, and Biennial's uh, Fourth Prospect New Orleans in the US, Liverpool Biennial, Sixth Berlin Biennial, the Ninth Biennial de Lyon, France, Mercosur Biennial in Brazil, and the Biennial, Biennial de Sao Paulo, Brazil, Tirana Biennial, Biennial of Sydney, and Istanbul Biennial. Um, I'm very pleased to, to welcome Minerva to discuss the work and to be with the program this week in the seminar. Um, very privileged, privileged and um, I'm happy that we can at least have, have you here by Zoom um, and, and hopefully at some point when the world has healed, we can invite you to Portland in person. But thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very curious about Portland. When I was uh, planning to go there, everybody had ideas and people they, they knew um, so I could meet them. So yeah, I was very sorry. I had to take the, the decision to uh, stay, but um, so far it has been great being able to meet some of you for the studio visits. We'll continue tomorrow. And well, I'll start sharing the screen. And I have too many projects, too much to show you, but I'll start by um, sharing um, what can give you an idea of the context here in Mexico City where um, I started um, some street interventions and somehow developing uh, strategies uh, that could uh, be used in other contexts. And instead of, let's say, exporting uh, some of the projects I was uh, working in Mexico City, I was very much responding to other uh, countries or context where I was invited to uh, produce um, either mural paintings, installations. So that's another um, thing with uh, uh, my artworks uh, is that um, they are very different in formal uh, terms, in, in formal solutions. So yes, what connects them is uh, research, uh, of course, also my own political uh, point of view. Um, but at the same time, at some point, I could see all the body of the work as uh, one single uh, project. So I will start with this uh, poster. This one was produced for um, 2019. And um, I usually produce graphic to distribute in Mexico uh, City or well, other contexts, but it's just distributed for free. This poster says uh, we are historical and the person on the 
design is Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. Uh, she was a nun and she's uh, no, uh, also well known as a writer and a big influence for er early feminism. So she appears in the money or used to appear now the uh, design of the uh, notes, the money, paper money is changing. So this is a, a photo of a, a women's demonstration in Mexico City. Here you see a, a view of the historical center, the main square, which is very much the political stage of the city. Uh, Mexico in general is super centralized. So anything that con um, it has to do with uh, social protest usually has to happen in the city, even if it's people uh, that come from very far away from rural contexts, usually, um, they, they come to Mexico City to demonstrate. So uh, yeah, that was that uh, design. This other one, uh, what is hell for if we have the nation? It's kind of playful black humor connected to uh, nationalism. And I usually distribute it sorry, um, when we are close or in the days of the independence celebration in, in Mexico. So there is all this uh, decoration connected to the uh, Mexican flag, the, the colors, the lights. Uh, there is a big um, uh, speech usually uh, and um, the distribution of the posters happen in that kind of uh, situation. Uh, usually I also take advantage of uh, demonstrations or more people on the streets to distribute uh, these posters for free. And what happens is that usually people adopts or uses the poster as a sign. Uh, they um, have appeared in very remote places, not only in the areas where I um, distribute them. So that means that also, well, people collect them. Uh, I don't think they collect it as an artwork, but more because they tend to identify with uh, the slogan or uh, the image, or you know, there is something that uh, concerns them. Um, there is. Uh, uh, connection. Well, this is a bad photo, but uh, it was very important for me because someone found it in a very remote area of Mexico in a public school, a primary school, and uh, it was there. This other uh, poster was for Cuba, for Havana in the year 2000. And there, um, uh, I didn't know what to expect. I had this uh, perception of uh, Cuba being a country with the blockage, but also uh, I don't know, information that uh, you could get anything if you had access to uh, dollars and not only the Cuban um, currency, the Cuban peso. So I didn't know really what to expect. No, we also know that in terms of education, they are very high level also in terms of uh, uh, public health. Uh, all that was only um, through uh, the information I had. So I designed this um, poster uh, saying nothing in excess, everything with moderation. And uh, it had also these two uh, possible uh, meanings for the local people there, some kind of uh, complaint. We don't have anything in excess because here everything is Russian or um, limited, or the other one, uh, some kind of uh, a proud statement that here we don't have any excess, we are uh, moderated in consumption um, 
uh, or let's say the, the capitalist uh, processes. So the distribution um, was like this. I was not expecting that the people was so receptive to get the poster because, well, it didn't have any nice graphic, you know, it was pure um, text. Uh, but anyway, they, they wanted to have it like in this uh, image on their uh, food cart or the taxi, the, the bike that you see on the background uh, that guy also wanted to have it there. It was difficult to paste the poster there, but they uh, really wanted to have it. Children and also Havana is a super clean uh, city. It has uh, no publicity at all, not even a photo photocopied information around the, the streets. So that was another um, surprise. Um, yeah, at the end, it was uh, part of uh, research uh, and an intervention uh, moment. I've uh, produced, as I mentioned, uh, mural paintings. And this is one of the first ones. Uh, this uh, specific design responded to an invitation I had by a uh, human rights observer, a friend of mine that went to Guatemala and realized that the conflict, the, the land conflict in Guatemala had to do still with uh, Del Monte, which was part of the United Fruit Company that historically has exploited all Central America and well now Africa and it was at some point also divided into the companies that became the, the banana uh, companies. So now it's almost impossible to track uh, which brands are connected to Del Monte. And apart from, from uh, generating uh, land conflicts, uh, they really um, had at some point uh, also a lot of political influence. It's connected also to the coup d'etat in uh, Guatemala, uh, but part of this influence also has to do with um, the uh, uh, killing of uh, indigenous populations and uh, also in terms of the econo economy of the co these countries. Uh, in Guatemala, for example, they had 40% of all the services of um, the region. So yeah, the early first design was this um, oval design and was produced as a fruit sticker. So I was distributing it in um, supermarkets, uh, just uh, intervening fruits and uh, also packages that uh, were connected to the uh, company. The modification of the double T as part of the design is because of Efraín Rios Mont, who, uh, well, still has, uh, is, has influence in, in uh, the politics of Guatemala, but he was one of the dictators that facilitated that uh, the United Fruit Company um, was uh, yeah was so powerful in the region. So here you see how I was using those um, stickers, and well, I I started uh, working with um, uh, brands, but more than that, it was um, a strategy to use or kind of parasite, the images that we all have already uh, in our own image bank. Uh, so one of the uh, uh, actions also connected to um, corporate presence and branding was this action. And for this one, uh, it happened first in, in France. For this one, I invited an actor to uh, give a speech 
or a monologue. Uh, he had to learn very specific information in connection to the unethical practices of McDonald's that could go from the chemicals in the food, uh, how they are involved in all the ecological crisis in the Amazons because of all the soy that needs to be produced for the cattle to uh, be fed. And um, he was not uh, protesting. Uh, he was being Ronald and inviting people to go inside of the uh, restaurant and even, well, talking to the employees, to the managers. Um, uh, he would also talk about um, uh, labor issues. Uh, so, yeah, it lasted like 20 minutes. It was very tense. It felt much longer, but um, it was uh, very good because he was always in control and very arrogant being the owner and, and being Ronald. Um, so, yeah, the context of Paris was also interesting because uh, also some people um, was there uh, demonstrating about the situation between uh, Israel and Palestine. There were also ex-employees of uh, McDonald's that approached the actor. Um, it was uh, very well um, executed. And this is how um, I've presented that project as an installation in museum spaces. Here you have the costume, so potentially it can happen again in any other context. Um, after that um, time, it happened again in Norway, but I couldn't find an actor. So um, the organizers found a performer that was uh, already more politically oriented but he was also louder and, and at that time there was a concert uh, there. So the police was very aware of what was going on on the streets and arrested him. And that generated a very interesting um, uh, situation because uh, the TV um, film, the arrest, and then it was transmitted on national TV. And the news was, of course, Ronald being arrested. So it was a very unique image. And um, that travel as international news, and then um, uh, also news sites from mainly from uh, the US also took that as uh, news. Then it happened in Mexico. It was almost a disaster because I couldn't find an actor or a performer. It had to be um, a clown, just for uh, like for children parties, and uh, he didn't really memorize the information. Uh, he invented things. Uh, it was an interesting situation because he entered the, the Chapultepec Park, which is meant to be public, but at the same time, all the food uh, area, it's uh, owned by McDonald's, even if it's not a McDonald's restaurant. So they called the security to kick him out and then the people was defending him. Um, so at the end, uh, you can see how the context where the work was presented also uh, affected or, or changed a little bit the, the work, the action. This other one, um, I think it's a good example to, to say again how I um, utilize the modification of branding. In this case, um, well, um, Equality instead of uh, Evian connects to this mental image we all have or reference we all have about Evian as a luxury uh, product. 
um, uh, French norm. It's using the uh, colors of the French flag. Uh, I think in general companies on branding, it's very aware of those associations. Um, and well, here it says a natural condition. And I was reflecting not so much on water um, scarcity, um, but the French um, multicultural societies and uh, society and the tension that there is in um, in France connected to that. Uh, and it happened a similar thing than with the other um, posters, but this time I didn't distribute it um, in the streets. It was first distributed inside a, a museum space and um, it was uh, students from the Ren University, the ones that asked me to borrow the design so they could use it as part of demonstrations um, against the right-wing uh, government. It was uh, when Le Pen was uh, very present again in uh, French politics. So it's okay if the interpretation of the work uh, connects to um, ecology or, or water distribution in the world, um, that's also perfectly okay. But the origin was this reflection on French society. It was also produced as part of the, the water bottle. So all of these were um, uh, distributed for free in this uh, museum space. And uh, I hadn't imagined how uh, good or yeah, uh, the, how good the strategy was going to end up being because um, if it's a poster, you either roll it or you use it in the demonstration, but the water bottle people had uh, had it around the, this uh, small city. Uh, this happened in San Nasser. Um, you could see children with the bottle in the bus or uh, playing in the park, or the bottle was kind of displayed on uh, coffee shops, that kind of situation. No, it was very, very present. And that's an important thing that when I work with a logo modification or branding, it usually never stops in, in the design, but also uh, it's distributed and there is a, a strategy of, um, yeah, just uh, uh, trying to spread it around the, the city or the place where the intervention is happening. Uh, it was also uh, at another time presented as a sign. This was uh, not in France, it was uh, uh, Montreal. It was uh, one of the first designs for mural paintings and uh, of course connects the colonization process of um, Spain in Mexico and well Telefonica is a Spanish company that at the end instead of um, new land or new territories is at the end um, getting more and more markets in Central and South America so they have a mobile cell phone brand called Movistar uh, so for me it was very easy to, to change it to colonization or yeah, colonize. And um, their slogan is, if you want, it happens. So again, it was very easy to change it if you don't want, it happens. Um, and uh, sometimes I even think that um, all this branding works as a photographic uh, element, you know, that the companies only present you the positive uh, of their image. Uh, but there is also another side and, and that sometimes it could be even found in their own um, commercial strategies. Um, you know, the, the Del Monte logo, it was also super easy to fit the two skulls inside the, the uh, 
kind of crown or tomato um, shape. Uh, so this was the, uh, the yeah one of the first murals painted. That was in Spain. Um, I get help from either sign painters, art students, um, graffiti artists, um, and well, they are all paid as uh, as painters for the job. I'll skip this one because there's too much material to show you. This. Um, design, here you have it in English. Um, it's a very old quote by Joseph uh, Proudhon, uh, who, is an, who was an anarchist, French, uh, and he wrote a text about what's to be uh, governed and uh, well, all what he lists um, somehow also reflects contemporary society. And that was really shocking to read, no? Uh, I mean, his original quote is uh, from 1849. So uh, all this list is, is totally connected to what we have at the present. And the colors I chose for the design were based on uh, the colors that political parties uh, were using in uh, Europe because this design was uh, first planned to be exhibited in Germany, Italy, and Austria. Uh, sorry. This other one was an interesting situation because in Ljubljana uh, there was a meeting between Bush and Putin. And I developed a billboard project that had to do with uh, Slovenia entering the European Union at that time. But also the main fear was that it was coming together with the NATO uh, uh, connection. And well, it had recently uh, gone through the uh, NATO intervention in the Balkans. Um, and well, it was distributed around a very small city and the billboard company was super friendly with the project and they match sometimes the Bush and Putin billboard together with the uh, design uh, talking about NATO. Uh, sometimes it was also Playboy or other things, but they, they really tried, tried to make their own statement um, of work uh, with other billboards. And this one is also connected to NATO. And uh, well, it was very specific to that context because in uh, Norway, the border with uh, Russia, there are many uh, nuclear bases uh, connected to NATO. And reading about them, um, I found information connected of, on how NATO could uh, use nuclear weapons, uh, even if no country is uh, attacking other with uh, nuclear weapons. And one of the environmental consequences would be um, nuclear winter, which is uh, basically that the uh, temperature, uh, not of only of that area, but uh, globally could drop also. Um, and uh, well, it was just uh, impressive how many um, military uh, bases NATO had in that border. So this was also presented in Norway. It was translated into Russian. That's why you see two of those here. I'll go to this other one. This was uh, also an intervention and probably it's one of the earliest works where I'm dealing with uh, the oil industry. Uh, this work is 
2002. And um, well, I was reading at that time about the new plans connected to the uh, pipeline in Alaska and how many um, uh, people connected to the uh, oil companies were loving or were being part of the Bush administration. And then um, I decided to use this kind of decal stickers or uh, yeah, the logos without modifying them. It was just the logos of the main oil companies on the pumping cars, but of course the pumping cars are electric, uh, but I was after the association of the companies crashing with each other or fighting for territories. And uh, well, the, the whole thing was uh, open for the general public for free for two weeks. It was meant to stay there two weeks. But at the end, uh, it stayed eight years because uh, the, the owners of this uh, fair decided to leave the, the stickers there. And the area got gentrified, so the whole uh, fair disappeared. And yeah, the cars stayed with the, with the logos. Um, later, the series of works that connected to um, global warming and the oil industry were part of a solo show called um, The Elephant's Revenge. And for this one, um, well, this uh, a mural, the, the painting is connected to uh, Pemex, the Mexican oil company. And this used to be the uh, warehouse of uh, Kuriman Suto Gallery. They didn't have an exhibition space. In fact, they started uh, by uh, showing in markets or um, other places they, they rented. So this was uh, their um, storage space. And I understood this series of works as some kind of visual essay with every element or with every work you could connect to ideas around um, ecology, classic ecology uh, or environmentalism uh, and also the oil industry. And yeah, it was my main first uh, uh, large project uh, also using oil, the, the, well, how you put it, yeah, tar or uh, what's the other name for it? Uh, uh, I can't remember, but yeah, it's basically tar. Um, I was also using pieces of pavement. Um, and this work was developed after I went on a trip to the south of Mexico to an area called uh, Campeche which is in the Gulf of Mexico, where all the oil, plat well, not all, but most of the oil platforms are. And there, uh, I really wanted to find the, the natural oil springs, but um, they were all uh, contained or blocked. Uh, and I could only find like this kind of, uh, uh, things in, in, on the beach. I went there with a, a researcher, a woman that wrote about the natural oil springs in Mexico. And uh, the associations uh, were uh, varied, no? It could be the uh, American interests, the uh, marine exploration, um, uh, classic images of uh, environmentalism, the ones connected to pollution, for example, uh, but also there were images, uh, well, photographs 
uh, of the oil platforms. And uh, those were in fact sold as postcards in the market in, in this city, um, uh, Ciudad del Carmen, which is totally dedicated to the oil industry. And uh, it was the workers of the oil platforms who took these photographs and they I found them uh, sold as, as postcards in the market uh, because no one can approach these areas. Those are high security areas. So yeah, those were the materials together with the objects sacrificed in, in tar. Also at, around that time, there was a, a, an accident in one of the oil platforms. So there were newspapers talking about it and that uh, platform stayed on fire for two months, I think. Uh, and well, yeah, those are the sacrificed objects. It was also a reference to how the Mayan culture used um, tar not only as uh, material for um, waterproofing, but uh, also it was used to cover um, sculptures and even as a dental fixing uh, material. So yeah, I tried to be playful and make these references, no, as, as I mentioned, the classic things also connected to uh, labor issues, no, this could be a strike uh, flag or connected to anarcho-syndicalism, uh, but it's a Mexican flag just dipped in a tar. There you can see a little bit of the emblem. Um, this was also the beginning of doing research on uh, these targets, which is basically um, also the uh, products, these uh, pesticides or insecticides that were produced and are still produced by the main oil companies, but that were part of branding in this kind of household items, no? like the uh, this spray pump. Here it says death to every pest and it includes the word shell. Uh, at that time it was uh, when I started working with um, tar and landscape, the concept of landscape and how we are um, at the end um, altering uh, natural landscapes. Uh, but also usually uh, these kind of paintings are a very uh, somehow domesticated vision of, of landscapes, no? all the uh, marines or um, yeah, nature or beautiful uh, uh, landscapes. I also started working with um, these kind of faces and it's all oil, no? I mean, also the flowers are uh, made of plastic, so uh, they they come from oil. One of the uh, connections also in that exhibition was um, the orography of Mexico and uh, more specifically the mountains, the volcanoes um, in this region, because it was the a geologist that wrote about these mountains, the one that made possible the commercial oil extraction in Mexico. It was not the engineers that were exploring the commercial possibilities, but him who used to write about the volcanoes and how, for example, uh, 50 or 100 donkeys were uh, taken to the top of the volcano to get um, a, a, well, it's not ice for all the refrigeration uh, purposes. This is um, also a reference to colonization and in some murals, um, sorry, I have to quickly go.
Sorry, thank you, but they were going to be ringing and ringing if I don't go. Um, so yeah, I was telling you that this mural is also connected to colonization and how the uh, Spanish uh, were depicting through illustrations what was meant to be like the, the uh, first and early images of um, uh, America. And um, I got interested uh, in them because at the end they are a distorted vision. I mean, they are uh, out of proportion and uh, in this mural, I combine that with um, imagine that was the original um, uh, logo or, or um, slogan by uh, Monsanto. And this one is the illustration where I took uh, those elements. So they are here at the bottom of um, the scene and you can see that the the maze it's uh, gigantic in comparison to the men here but uh, also gigantic in comparison to the banana so for me that's the uh, part of this distorted vision of what they found especially in terms of um, nature uh, plants, animals, because uh, also, well, yeah, the animals are another reference that uh, usually had um, human faces. Uh, and whenever I present that mural, it, uh, also, it's also presented with uh, a fruit salad. And uh, well, the thing is that usually people think uh, the fruit comes from Mexico or somehow gives uh, uh, the connotation of the exotic. And well, this also happened in France. They were uh, uh, trying to also eat these, the big pieces of fruit and they asked the museum for a knife. So quite savage, they really wanted to finish all the fruit there. Uh, this is the other example of an early illustration. Oh, here you see the human face. This mural is called America. Uh, that's another exhibition. I've continued to make references to uh, yeah, the, the chemical industry that also connects to the pharmaceutical industry. And um, this mural was presented in Germany. Uh, so the, the references are uh, connections to some um, German brands, but also uh, the colors of the box of aspirin, for example, but also how that comes from, uh, well, in general, all um, Pharmaceutical products also have a natural origin. The other mural was presented at the Dallas Museum of Art. And well, the title Land, Liberty, Life um, connects to uh, a big influence in my practice and, and theory, which is uh, uh, Ricardo Flores Magón a uh, Mexican anarchist that uh, at the end, well, many other people also generated somehow the climate for, for revolution in Mexico. So 
this uh, mural in Dallas was meant to be a kind of landscape uh, portraying uh, yeah, natural resources, but also questioning, well, is it, is it Dallas? Is it Texas? It was, it used to be Mexico. Is it Mexico? Is it indigenous land? So at the end, it was a bunch of references that also included the oil industry, uh, but uh, well, mainly the economy in, in Dallas is connected also to the electronics, uh, uh, Texas instruments. So there is a reference to the indigenous here with the basket. Um, also the uh, guns, the, the weapons industry. Um, there are targets in the final design. I don't know if they're here. Yeah, here you see a target. Uh, I don't know where. So it was interesting that for this one, they had the area where we were painting open uh, because it was connecting to areas of the museum. And uh, yeah, like these groups of children or elderly people visiting in groups uh, were asking questions and looking at the uh, process. Here you see an ant that is carrying a microchip and that was taken from uh, an actual real photograph. Uh, they found really an ant carrying a microchip. Uh, prairie dogs with um, a uh, bulletproof vest. It is um, one work that um, is connected to the, uh, the research is connected to the uh, Native Americans. I was in Canada doing a residency at the BAMF Center, a short uh, stay. Uh, so they asked me to present a performance or action because uh, it was all part of a festival. And um, uh, well, what happened is that the first thing I could create was uh, a design, a graphic, because uh, I was reading a, a speech by Sitting Bull talking about the uh, their land, and he was saying, we are not impressed by the white man's civilization, uh, kind of just leave us alone. And that stayed with me, and that's how the, the design um, happened. Uh, but I was invited to do a performance piece, not a, a, a design um, or a poster, so I thought, okay, how can I translate this graphic into an action? And what I did is, well, I was staying um, at the facilities of the BAM Center, which are totally urban, uh, but it's in the middle of this uh, uh, park, and there is a lot of wilderness. Uh, so I ended up uh, going to the forest and spend one night um, there. Um, I didn't know it was illegal. Uh, I knew it could be dangerous because uh, there are bears in the area. Um, uh, it was cold, it was not winter, but it was very cold. And um, I didn't have the proper equipment to sleep outdoors. So it was very, very basic. Um, it was some kind of abandonment uh, process of, okay, I'll just grab what I have. I had only a torch and I borrowed the camera and uh, the video lasted what the light of the torch lasted. The camera kept recording. I was looking for the place where I could sleep. Um, I found uh, animals, mainly deers, uh, uh, and it was later presented as uh, a video installation in their gallery space, uh, but also uh, we had this chocolate cake in the shape of a Rocky Mountain that uh, the visitors could eat. 
So uh, yeah, it was at the end problem solve of the um, performance piece uh, they ask for. This is one of my favorite um, projects and it happened in Spain. It was 2003 and they also invited me to generate a public art project. And being in this um, neighborhood called Lava Pies, I realized that there was a lot of um, cultural activities. Um, there were um, community centers, uh, there were um, many nationalities uh, 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 exchanging or, or uh, yeah, just um, uh, okay with each other and, and um, I realized that the musicians were basically going to other areas of the city to play as buskers and um, the idea for this piece was to organize a concert for their neighborhood uh, just somehow bringing them back so I distributed flyers and posters um, calling uh, these musicians to uh, be part of a half an hour concert. Uh, the thing is that they had to play what they usually play. Uh, and it was a very uh, big variety of uh, instruments and styles of music. Uh, there was a classic, there were groups of uh, Cuban song, um, uh, punk, uh, uh, do it, uh, some artists that had an invented instrument and they didn't do any rehearsal. They were not directing by anyone, but they had to just come together and play what they usually play. So I thought, okay, it's going to be a, a noisy concert. Um, it will be very difficult to recognize styles of music. Let's see what happens. And um, what happened is that there was harmony. They kind of communicated. And if I had been a musician, probably I uh, could have guessed what was going to happen. Uh, uh, but I guess for me, this is one of the examples of how these kind of uh, cultural experiments can only happen in the field of art because um, I was not expecting harmony uh, or, or them finding a, a common rhythm and they found this common language um, without anyone directing them. Uh, also, I'm not a sociologist, but I could just bring together this group of people and um, uh, the best part of, of the um, exercise uh, was that um, the organizers of this um, uh, intervention or festival of uh, public art told me that uh, like two years after this concert happened there, um, many of them, you know, a group got together and played another concert. And well, that's impossible to, to uh, predict, no? I mean, there was no good or bad result in this situation. It was very much putting the elements together. Um, so for me, that's the aesthetic process, not bringing them together and there is no good or bad outcome. It, it happens and it's a unique situation. Um, um, group of works that also connects to the uh, oil series. It's uh, this one that uh, was a reflection on the cacao industry and cannibalism. So I started thinking and linking these two things because of um, a visit I did to an uh, ethnographic museum where I could see that many of the pre-Hispanic um, currency um, uh, from the Americas uh, was part of the collection of this museum in Germany. 
that was donated by a German bank. So the German bank had also uh, stickers of the registration or um, yeah number and um, somehow labeled the the this old currency with their logo. So I started wondering about um, value. Of course, I was interested in those um, different kinds of currencies that I could um, see in the collection. And um, at some point in, in the history of uh, uh, the pre-Hispanic um, uh, life in, in, in Mexico, cacao was uh, a form of currency. So that's how I started uh, trying to, to find also the um, Mexican cacao or, or cacao from Mesoamerica, because the situation at the moment is that well, the origin of chocolate or cacao is uh, Mesoamerica. And uh, in Mexico, all the chocolate industry is using the African cacao because uh, it's much cheaper. Uh, but the thing is that uh, the Mexican one goes to Switzerland or Belgium because it's uh, very high quality. So all the production is already reserved uh, to be um, a, used by, by the big uh, chocolate companies in those countries. So yeah, it was hard to find. I could find a person that was, uh, well, not only working with the, uh, a little of the uh, Mexican production, but also interested in all the cultural associations uh, uh, with chocolate. And the thing is that the area where oil is, um, the area of oil in, in, in Mexico is very much the same area where cacao is growing. And what happened is that after the uh, commercializ commercialization of um, oil uh, and the foreign companies coming to uh, Mexico, uh, many of the people dedicated to the agriculture of cacao ended up working for Pemex or the different oil industries in the area. So also the, that's why the, the production suffer. Also the um, uh, monocultivos, how you say that in English? Um, Monoculture. Well, just, yeah, like one, one uh, single um, um, thing like uh, sugar cane or, or other things replaced also the uh, cacao fields that are more difficult to, to maintain. And well, in general, the people there haven't had the chance to um, uh, continue with their own uh, uh, industry or, or small industry or process, no? like making a, a a little bit more of money because they are badly paid for their production. And that's also why they stop uh, working um, agriculture and end up working for companies uh, there. So as part of the exhibition, I was connecting it to uh, also the use of the term cannibal, um, the word cannibal and how it has been used to justify the um, civilizatory or, or uh, yeah, the conquest of uh, territories and cultures. Um, because of course, anyone that was uh, strange, ugly, it was a cannibal for the Spanish. Um, so as part of this installation, I was using um, uh, human bones, uh, it's a replica, and I was dipping them in this, uh, uh, Mexican chocolate. The reference of the monkey is um, interesting because um, there's a lot of mythology connecting uh, uh, maize or corn with uh, animals and deities, but uh, the cacao, not so much, but there are um, 
uh, some clues about uh, what kind of mythology was associated with cacao, which was a precious uh, uh, seed, uh, mainly um, uh, consumed as a drink, like a fermented uh, drink, but only in rituals. Um, so the thing with the monkeys is that uh, they appear in pottery, in um, things that were used to, to uh, have these drinks and um, or make ceremonies. And the thing is, yeah, the monkeys eat the fruit and then they shit around the seed and fertilize and make the, the trees grow. So that's why the monkeys appear on some of the pottery, the pre-Hispanic one. One very important uh, reference when I was producing this series of works was the uh, Canibalia essay by Carlos Jauregui. And he very much uh, uh, does that, no? goes around the associations um, or, or uh, in which situations the, the word cannibal has been used to uh, repress you know, in, in general, to fear the other. Um, so one of the things he mentions is that there has been more real um, cannibalism in Europe than in the Americas. And we always have this association of, okay, it's the uh, Brazilian Indians, the Tupinamba, the ones that are the cannibals. Um, nowadays, they, they don't remember about that at all, but they are known for being cannibals. Uh, so yeah, it was very interesting to, to learn that, um, uh, the, the, that Europe had many more um, cases of, of real cannibalism than the Americas. And the area inside the, the Hershey's um, wrap the chocolate is a scene of European cannibalism. It's very hard to, to see there, but here is an, uh, a graphic also connected to, to that. England, Spain, Russia. Um, so I also insisted on, on branding and uh, modifying brands. That's hand painted also. These paintings, well, this, I only changed the shape of the kisses a little bit. Um, I produce a series of um, uh, silk screen signs uh, that uh, were printed not with ink, but with chocolate. I had to mix chocolate and, uh, oh, um, what is it, like some kind of medium, acrylic medium to, to manage to make a, a something that could be, uh, kind of uh, stable on the paper. So here it says the cannibals are ugly and the ugly ones are cannibals. Cannibal is the anti-imperialist Latin America. Uh, here, well, it's uh, super hard for you to read, I guess, but um, uh, it was... Uh, I had a conversation with one of the uh, anthropologists that uh, traveled to get some of the objects in the um, ethnographic museum in Germany. So he was the one going to the uh, Brazilian um, communities, the Indian communities and uh, getting the stories, but also getting the objects. And as part of my conversation, there were many interesting things for me, like uh, he was saying that also the, the Indians were very interested in getting objects. Um, uh, he was uh, sometimes uh, bringing with him uh, like high-tech fishing rods 
or other things that he thought could be useful for them. And they didn't want the fishing rods, like this uh, fancy equipment. They wanted like his pants or some toilet paper or, or things that, um, yeah, um, he couldn't really <laughs> understand. But um, yeah, it was a, a way to, to, to learn uh, through his own narration how were these trips to get uh, objects and as part of the uh, stories that he that they told him uh, one was really interesting which was that uh, at some point they mentioned they had the proof that the white men were uh, eating uh, were cannibals were eating other humans and they say they had seen one one can of food that was human meat. And then I thought, okay, they must have seen something with a brand that was uh, a person. And then I started searching um, uh, for, for antiques and I found this um, can of oysters that has a, a I, sorry, a, the head of a human and probably this could have been the uh, what they thought was the proof of the white uh, men eating uh, human meat. Um, for me the most important uh, piece in the in this exhibition was a um, uh, machine, this machine that um, has a timer and drops uh, a little bit of chocolate every six seconds. And well, that's, uh, or that was at that point when I uh, planned the work, um, that was a statistic of people that um, died of starvation. Uh, that's the official uh, statistic. So the drop is falling and then it forms a kind of sculpture that could be this volcanic sculpture. Sometimes it was more phallic. It was changing depending of the uh, weather as well. Um, it's very sensitive. And that's why you see here in this photo that some parts are liquid and some parts are uh, already solid. How are we doing them? OK. This um, is also a very important uh, work for me. And what you see here is the Rio Bravo or Rio Grande. Um, and I was again invited to do something um, uh, in uh, the area of the Chihuahuan Desert near um, the, the river in in Marfa, there is a project space. Uh, and well, I've never been in, in that area or in the border or in the river itself. And my first ideas were about this uh, exchange or, or communication that happens anyway, you know, the air, uh, the animals that can um, uh, migrate, uh, but also, like um, cellular uh, networks, the, the, yeah, the mobile phones uh, can take one, the Mexican or the um, United States network, depending of where you point the telephone sometimes. So uh, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, of course, I, the information I had was very much connected to um, uh, the general ideas connected to the border, you no, know, the limit, the surveillance, the wall, the well, this happened in 2010. Um, uh, the border patrol, uh, violence, uh, really horrible things happening in uh, the border. And well, the border is. Uh, historically the river, but not only the river, but the deepest part of the river. So going on this trip, 
I found out that, um, well, the river was changing, of course, no? Sometimes it could split in two, sometimes it was uh, dry or uh, very far deep uh, under a canyon uh, or just beside the road. Um, and little by little, uh, the, that idea of uh, a frontier or border disappeared. Uh, it was abstract, but then when I um, continued traveling, I found uh, an area where I could I could cross, uh, hoping from one rock to the next one, and um, that was of course illegal and dangerous and, and <laughs> the usual um, things. But uh, uh, the the thing was that. Um, uh, there was no sign. It was only in our um, imagination or political imagination that that was the, the border. No, in fact, the uh, strongest thing there it's the desert itself. There are really harsh conditions to uh, cross a part of of the desert. So yeah, I went there and and painted with um, limestone these kind of lines uh, as a dotted line where you could cross. I only had with me a, a zip lock back with my passport and then crossed from the US to Mexico and back. Uh, and it was documented like this on photographs. Um, so at the end, that was my, my project. Um, for this uh, exhibition space here, you can see, well, the area of Mexico is erased, but this was the area where I, I crossed uh, and collected some uh, material. So a part of the uh, photographic documentation, I managed to get like these kind of uh, uh, cans, like totally, uh, almost destroyed, but uh, for sure they belong to, to migrants. Uh, some water of the uh, river, the brush I use, um, some rocks. Uh, here you see more of the elements and then also uh, books about, about the river, little flowers and plants. Uh, I've worked also with the National Geographic magazine quite often. And um, uh, this one uh, had an article uh, precisely about that uh, area of Texas. And there is an interesting photo. Oh, I don't have it here. Uh, but this, this man here is... Uh, the, the caption of the photo says he's closing the gate of the of the country, the United States. Um, yeah, these kind of postcards and that's a book. Uh, well, a couple of books on the river, but also for me, the reference to walking as a political act was uh, important because that's how I sorry how I have also tried to uh, evaluate the, the public demonstrations um, that happen in Mexico um, quite often and more in, in Mexico City. We can have four demonstrations around the area where my studio is, which is the historical uh, center. Oh, sorry. And well, that takes me to a video work that is precisely about uh, mapping dissidence and resistance in Mexico City. And that's um, uh, also the end of the lecture. It's already one hour 30, but I'll, I'll show you a few still images. Um, so, oh, yeah, that's uh, one of the scenes in this 
video and well here for example the the architecture itself uh, was already planned to to be uh, displaying this kind of um, political references the street demonstrations connected to uh, student um, well, the 68 in Mexico was also very important. Uh, the uh, demonstrations connected to uh, NAFTA and yeah, what happens with those kind of uh, economic agreements uh, is still part of the historical center. This is the National University, uh, but the thing with this video is that I I see it more as an archive of uh, resistance and um, uh, also uh, cultural resistance or economic resistance in in Mexico. No, not only uh, Mexico City, not only the the uh, public demonstrations. Uh, so I think we can stop here the presentation and uh, I think we'll we'll have a break or what's the plan now? Let me know. Yeah, did you want to show some of the video first or did you want to um, end and move on to the seminar? It's up to you. I think we can move on. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I can also uh, arrange how to play the video and yeah it's one hour 30 one hour and a half now okay so just uh, say thank you very much to Minerva for for your presentation and uh thank you everyone for joining so what we're going to do now is uh is close this zoom link and for those of us in the seminar um please click the zoom link for the seminar portion of the day. Thank you very much. Okay. See you later, most of you. <laughs>